I turned the ring light up to high just to see what it would do. The answer is blind me. Hey there, Internet. I'm going to keep this intro real short today. If you're new here, welcome. If you have been with me for this whole series, welcome back. Let's just get on with the video, shall we? It's the day after rehearsal. I am all showered and clean, hence why I'm extra barefaced. Rehearsal went really well last night. I had a lot of fun. We broke down the Titania Oberon puck scene, wherein they lay down exactly where they're mad at each other. And initially we were doing it like we always have. We just played it up, played with blocking, played with intentions, but then Dalen, our director, had us do a beautiful exercise. I didn't do it, I watched, but. They stripped away all of the acting, all of the oomph to it, and just sat across from each other, Titania and Oberon, and talked. He said their lines, but instead of it being this grand fight between a king and a queen, it became this really painful argument between a husband and a wife, or at least two lovers. You really got, we did it a couple of times, and each time just the pain that was coming through. Both of them were hurting in this exercise, and I think I would still side with Titania on this one, but... The more we went through it, and the more times they practiced it in just a conversational way, the more you could see the heart of Oberon. Whereas before, he seemed a little bit like a jerk at times. Like he wasn't listening to her, and it was like he didn't care, but as they broke it down, it became slightly less that he's not hearing her, and more just he feels this is important to have the child on his side and she obviously feels important that it's important for the child to stay with her due to the reasons she goes into in the second monologue but they both so badly want it to work but they're both a little stubborn and they don't want to give on it and finding that in rehearsal last night added a whole new element to that scene which, in turn, is the reason the show happens. It's not Puck. This fight between these two loves is the reason the rest of the show happens. In turn, that gave me a bunch of new things to play on, because when we tried it again in full, we were playing with incorporating what we found in that breakdown. And we're going to continue to play with it and try to find a middle ground between what we ended up doing last night and what we will than the vibrato from before, but incorporating the heart that we found really added a whole new vibe to that scene and a whole new heart that wasn't there before. And as Puck, that gave me a lot more to play on. Because before, Puck in that scene is just kind of almost like a hype man. I'm there to just support Oberon, ooh and ah, where it's important, laugh when we kind of mock Titania, but with that pain there, Puck is much more awkward. I still try to interject and be a hype man, but the fight clearly became not a grand duel between a queen and a king, but a really intimate argument between Oberon and Titania. And Puck and the fairies who are off to the side in this argument get a bit awkward. Mom and dad are fighting. And they didn't intend the kids to see it, but here we are. And Puck doesn't like it. For all that Puck works for Oberon and for all that Puck is on Oberon's side, I like Titania. Especially once she reveals exactly why she's so invested in keeping this kid which Puck hadn't heard before, because Puck would have only heard Oberon's side to this, since Tanya has been away. Puck feels for her. Puck understands. And 
ultimately, I have to listen to Oberon, but... Come on, Agnes. But it makes for a much more torn puck. It makes, then, the actions later in the play much more infused with a little bit of desperation. Because if Puck doesn't amend this, if Puck doesn't do what Oberon asks, if Puck doesn't get that flower and in turn magic the people Oberon wants me to magic, the fight can't end. And as Titania outlines early in that fight scene, the land is suffering due to this fight, which in turn means the people are suffering due to this fight. And Puck likes people. I have a whole monologue about that. So, it infuses that desperation in that not only will this fight not end if I don't do my job right, people might die or at least greatly suffer if I don't do this right. And I think Puck just wants the fight to be over, if nothing else. His king isn't happy. And everything is hurting because of that fight. So I will be spending the day with four of my favorite doggos, and then a new one I'll get to meet later tonight. So I am in a good, oh, you found a stick. You found a big old stick. Oh, you're so happy. <laughs> the doggo I'm with right now, her life's mission is to find the biggest stick she can and then hold it in her mouth like it's a trophy. That's all she loves to do because she is a good, good baby. And I love her. So yeah, I am, if you can't tell, I'm having a great day. <laughs> yeah! Oh, jumpy baby. Hello. Got it. I have got the ball of rope. Shout out to my clients for having the coolest freaking roof lounge area. It's unheard of. At least in LA apartment standards. It is Wednesday, and you know what that means. Theater time. Tonight in theory, we are running through all of the fairy scenes. Um, I don't know how many of that will include kind of the solo puck scenes as I have a number of them that are like me and the random fairy me um, talking over the humans as I magic them. So I don't know exactly how many I'm going to do tonight. Eh? I know we'll for sure do the two opening scenes that we've been working. We're going to try to find that middle ground I talked about before in the Oberon Puck Titania scene that we made really good progress on last week, so I'm excited to work that. I'm struggling a bit with the I'll follow you puck monologue in the actor scene. Um, despite recording it on my phone and looking over the lines and practicing and all that, the two lines after I'll follow you, which transition into all the listing of the animals, I'm really having a hard time getting into my head. I can do the ending and I can do the beginning, but I'm just having trouble getting that middle transition-y bit into my noggin and it's driving me nuts. So if any of y'all have recommendations on how to get tricky lines or tricky whatever you need to memorize in your head, leave that down below because I could use a hand. <laughs> Yeah, rehearsal went pretty good. We was today focused more on the physicality, or at least for Puck it did. Um, we ran the all of the fairy scenes, at least all the ones that had like the Oberon, Titania, Puck trio, and then a couple of beginning and end scenes. We got to play more with the dynamic between the characters, which was pretty fun because. Last week was more with Titania and Oberon, and a lot of today we worked the dynamic between Titania and Puck, Puck and this king and queen together, how I reacted to everything in front of me. I learned a bunch more about how Puck will interact with both the fairy in the beginning and with Oberon. Um, I get to be a lot more mischievous, which is great. It was looking 
I thought like I wasn't going to as much, but we brought that back in, so I'm really excited. We've been lightly incorporating props. Uh, Oberon's staff has been really fun to play with in the Puck Titania Oberon scene. But I played up the fluidity of Puck a lot more, and that really helped me feel more connected with the scene. I love how collaborative theater can be, and it's not always going to be. Certain directors are going to have their vision and want to be rigidly stuck to it, but I as an actor really appreciate when they'll work with you to help make the show better. Like One little example was we were trying to figure out how to get Oberon to kneel for this one moment that the director wanted to have, and we're still working on that, but uh, as we were trying to figure out how Titania could like exert her power even more, I had the idea of, oh, what if she took the staff and kind of pointed it down at him? And Dale and our director got really excited. It was like, oh yeah, we're, I, we gotta figure out the kneeling move, but that would look super cool. Let's do it. And I mean, I always say I'm happy my guy, my, that my idea got used, but it made me happy that each of us, in our own way, gets to contribute to the final production of the show. It's not just contributing or acting, but here and there, we get to contribute our ideas and help in our own ways to make the show better. Because sometimes our ideas may not totally sink into what Daylin is seeing, and that's okay. But I love when directorial teams are willing to take that step with you and respect the fact that you are also a creative person and that you also have a deep love for the show and want to make it the best it can be. And I think that's very healthy and good for the theatrical environment. My apologies for the lighting in the last clip. Coming out of rehearsal, I was really excited to get all my thoughts out and all the ideas I had in my head rolling around and I didn't take into account that Street lights are inconsistent, especially when you're in a moving car and it's almost 10 p.m. So yeah, I'm a hopefully I will have some measure of a success in editing that to look a little lighter, but... Eh? Eh? Bear with me, I'm still learning all the tricks and tips and things on making videos and vlogging and whatnot. Today I want to talk about different ways of approaching your lines when you may be stuck or you maybe want to try to find new things. So as I've already told you in the vlog earlier, we tried that new technique for Oberon and Titania where they just stripped everything away and just sat down and had their scene as though it were a conversation. That is one technique and I think it worked really well. Sometimes when you're practicing your lines, be it for Shakespeare or for anything in general, it can be really easy to get used to how you say a line, get used to just the script in general, and it becomes trickier the longer you get stuck in that pattern to switch things up, which in turn means you're not gonna find as many new things. That's where switching it up and different techniques come in handy. For our scene, it worked really well because it was so conversational to just have it as a conversation. In doing so, we were able to get to the emotion of it because by that point we'd gotten so used to just the drama and the fighting and the meh of it all that we'd kind of forgotten the roots of it, that that specific scene was a marital fight. On a non-Shakespearean side note, there's a monologue I've been using for a while now that I need to probably update at this point for auditions that I hadn't been as into lately. It just wasn't resonating with me anymore. I'd done it so much. I'd practiced it so many times. But at an audition about a month ago, I believe, they asked me after I finished performing, hey, can you do any accents? Can you do a British accent? And I said, yes. He said, can you do that monologue again with the accent? And I noticed as I was performing and after, when I was kind of thinking back how I did, I had a lot more fun with it when I threw an accent in there. It made me approach the script in a new way, and it made me think about everything in a new way. 
So besides stripping down all of the drama, emotion, predetermined bravado of the scene, you could also try throwing an accent on top of your lines, script, monologue, etc. Because sometimes speaking something in a new way can help you approach it in a new way. Another technique that I've seen employed a lot that I find to be really fun and that we get used and that gets used in improv a lot is over dramatizing or doing things you know you definitely won't do in the show. If you have a line that you know, say, is supposed to be high drama, really sincere, uh, to pull from the show, believe me, King of Shadows, I mistook. For me, in the actual context of the show, that's pretty darn sincere. Puck is trying to tell the king, hey, I did not do this on purpose. Now, if I was getting a bit complacent in that, and just used to how I'm saying it, I might want to try playing it as though Puck was trying to be a fraternity jerk bag who is trying to flirt with the king. Like, something you would never do for the actual character or for the actual line. But sometimes exaggerating the things your line the things you're saying, exaggerating your lines, can get you so out of your head and having fun with it that you start to see things in a new way by virtue of doing it in a new way. It forces you to break those habits, at least temporarily, that you've formed around those lines, and you start to see little bits and pieces maybe that you either didn't realize because you'd become so falling into a habit with a line, maybe you realize you want to play something in a different way. I realized with that monologue I mentioned, just how giddy the character is in the middle section, whereas before I had been kind of as though the character were sick of her scenario that she was in. In playing with it and making it British, I found a whole new joy. And in rehearsing it afterward, just to see what else I could find, in playing it overly exaggerated and, or playing it with intentions or emotions that I wouldn't naturally pin to it, I found a lot more stuff than I would have thought and stuff that I hadn't found before. And that's awesome. If it might feel a little stupid sometimes doing these exercises or doing certain improv tactics if you're throwing that at your script, but sometimes if it feels stupid, you're doing it right. Not everything in theater and acting is gonna be perfectly serious, like high art and drama and Oscar winning ter No, sometimes it's putting on a stupid accent that came from nowhere and saying your lines as though you're a silly cartoon character on the run from Bugs Bunny or something ridiculous. Sometimes you have to think outside the box and let yourself be a little stupid. There's no shame in trying to better your craft and your script by letting yourself have fun. Because like I said in vlogs before, this should be fun. You should like the thing you're doing. If you've stopped having fun with your project and it becomes a grind, it's time to approach it in a new way. And that might mean putting on a silly accent for it. That might mean having your friend read the scene with you as the other person in the scene and being ridiculous together. Whatever it takes for you to get in a better headspace for it, that's awesome. And do it. There are no rules when it comes to exactly how we get set in our lines and in our comfort levels around those lines. Whatever works for you is what works for you. Thank you guys for watching. As always, if you haven't, hit like, hit subscribe, hit that bell so you get notifications every time I post a new video. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye!